Good morning and welcome to The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. It's so great that you have taken the time to worship with us today. And so I just want to extend grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist. And today is one of the high holy days in the church. It is Palm Sunday. We're just a week from Easter, but before we get there, we are going to remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it is significant for a lot of reasons. And Pastor Julia is going to talk about that in her message for today. And we're going to see how um, this event of Jesus coming into Jerusalem um, may have been um, envisioned by many different people uh, that are within that story. And so I invite you to, uh, to sit back and, and really experience um, this message today. I hope that you will find it both meaningful and inspiring. So let us now worship the Lord our God. Please join me in the congregational prayer. The words are found on the screen. Jesus, as we journey with you to Jerusalem, keep us close by your side. Give us strength to follow you wherever you lead, even to the cross. Amen.
Hello, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of your associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I'm going to be leading us in the morning prayer today. Uh, during the prayer, I'll be pausing at a certain point to give you the opportunity to speak the names of individuals that you're concerned about and that you want to lift up in prayer today. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, most merciful, in the beginning you created us, and by the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, you created us anew. Work in us now, both to will and to do what pleases you. Grant us your grace and heavenly blessing, that in whatever work we engage, we may do all to your honor and glory. Keep us, O Lord, from sin, and empower us daily to do good works, that we may always honor you, not with our words only, but with our actions also. And at that time, when our earthly life has been completed, we pray that you will give us pardon for all our sins and receive us to eternal life. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to live lives through which you bless others. Through Jesus Christ we pray. And as Jesus taught His disciples to pray, so now we also pray as God's confident children, praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And now for the next few moments, we reflect on our Christian stewardship and how we invest in the kingdom of God with our time, our talents, and our gifts. You can give and worship God through your giving in several ways. First of all, by attending a live worship service or by sending a check through the U.S. mail to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. You can also give through our church webpage and our church cell phone app. Now it's time for the children's message. And so if you have children or youth that are watching the video today, uh, that's great. If they're not watching, be sure and call them over at this time because I've got some things to share with them. Now, this video service is being uh, filmed for Palm Sunday. And so, guys, I want to talk with you a little bit about Palm Sunday. Now, just a couple of months ago, I led a mission team to the country of Sri Lanka in South Asia. It's over near India. And we went around to different villages. We were doing medical clinics and other things. And many of the villages we went to, the people came out in droves. They uh, welcomed us. We were often welcomed with garlands of flowers around our necks. In a couple of places, we even had a parade to lead us down into the village. And it was, it was very exciting. You know, everybody loves a parade. Um, when we have a Christmas parade, uh, we all get very excited. And what excites us most is the very last thing in the parade. What's the last thing in the Christmas parade? That's right, it's Santa Claus. And everybody gets so excited uh, and cheers for Santa when he comes. 
Well, that was much like the scene in Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. King Jesus was coming into the city. People lined the streets, and some people walked in, in front of Him, some people walked behind Him. Instead of a fire truck or a float, Jesus was riding on the back of a donkey. Now, I want us to practice doing what the people of Jerusalem did that day. As He rode through the streets of Jerusalem, some of the people waved palm branches. Anybody got a palm branch handy? Okay, if not, just use your hands and wave them back and forth. Here, I've got my palm branch. So they were waving palm branches and then they would even throw them down on the ground in front. So you can wave your hands and pretend that you're uh, throwing that palm branch down. And then the people that welcomed Jesus were, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So let, let's say all that together. Let's shout it in fact, okay? We're going to say, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, on three. One, two, three. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were welcoming Jesus. And then the other thing they did was some of the people took off their coats and threw them down on the roadway for Jesus to ride over. So I even brought my coat, this is my jacket, and so I'm just going to toss it down onto the street, right where Jesus would come, right over it. So you pretend to take your coat off and throw it down on the street. And that's how they welcomed Jesus on that Palm Sunday. Now today we are celebrating Palm Sunday and we're celebrating the entry of Jesus, our King, into Jerusalem. It was the, a day that marked the beginning of an incredible week. And you'll hear more about it in the service. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we just pray that you'll bless the children and youth of our church and community, all those that are watching the video today and their families. And help us to join our voices with the voices of the people in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago when they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord as they welcome Jesus. May we welcome Jesus into our lives. In His name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring you our scripture passage today. Our scripture comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. Hear now this word. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And he rode along. People kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing to hear a word from you. God, I pray that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, you won't read about it in your Bibles, but there were two parades that day. Palm Sunday, that is. Not that they called it that back then. Pontius Pilate sure didn't. Once a year, Pilate had to leave this gorgeous beachside palace he had in Caesarea for what the Jews call Passover. Pilate isn't his cronies in Rome, though. They have a different name for it, an insurrection waiting to happen. Every year, thousands of Jews come from miles away to celebrate in their holy city. Of course, all those tourists are pretty good for the local economy. They buy food for their parties and stay in the local inns. And most importantly, they pay taxes that help line the pockets of Caesar. But the problem is what the Jews are celebrating. They claim that they were slaves in Egypt, but their God rescued them from Pharaoh. Yeah, right. Still, Rome didn't need a bunch of these Jews getting together and dreaming of their God helping them overthrow the government. So every year, Pilate rides into town just to remind everyone who's in charge. They give everyone a little show, a parade to remind the Jews of just how much the Roman military can really do. Now, he doesn't like to admit it, but Pilate doesn't so much mind this little trip. There's just something about it. The steady bounce, the clip-clop, clip-clop of his mighty war horse beneath him. The weight of his armor on his shoulders, the way that the light reflects off the sword that he keeps on his side. All those peasants grateful to him, the representative of Caesar, for bringing the prosperity of the Pax Romana to their little town so that even they have the privilege of being part of the greatest empire the world will ever know. They wave palm branches as he rides in each year, their way of welcoming him as a conquering hero. But this year, the crowds seem a little sparse. Are there less people visiting the city? They keep their steady procession coming in from the west, but the crowds just aren't getting any bigger. Finally, Pilate motions to one of his underlings. What's this about? Why aren't the streets filled up like they usually are? The servant hesitates, looks away, and then finally says, My lord, it seems they're with this man, Jesus. Pilate combs back through his memories. Jesus, Jesus, the name, it sounds familiar. Oh, yes, that traveling teacher that Herod wrote me about. Herod saw him as a threat, but Herod was always a little skittish. Surely that peasant from, where was it again? Galilee? Surely he can't be a threat to Pilate. Then, coming from the east, Pilate catches the sounds of shouting. It's jubilant. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But they aren't shouting for him. Pilate settles into his saddle and grips his sword a little tighter. This is shaping up to be an interesting visit. On the other side of Jerusalem, near the Mount of Olives, the disciples have prepared Jesus to ride into Jerusalem. Peter walks, almost jogging every third step, keeping in step with the donkey that's carrying Jesus. His heart is racing. Finally, finally they are here. They have been journeying towards Jerusalem for so long now, always awaiting this moment. He 
he looks at the crowd, sees them waving palm branches and shouting out for Jesus. He swells with pride. That's his master, his teacher, who called him. Peter notices James and John, as always, trying to get just as close and feels mildly suspicious of what they might be up to. While the other disciples are jockeying for a place closest to Jesus and waving to the crowds, Judas is paying attention. He's always paying attention. Judas is practical. He isn't like those simple-minded fishermen brothers that Jesus is so fond of. There's a reason that Judas is in charge of the finances. Jesus needs someone with a sensible eye to look after him. Someone to bring his head down from the clouds and see the real world realities that they're up against. So of course it's Judas who notices those sidelong glances the Pharisees are giving them all. Why couldn't Jesus just be content to be a great leader, a great teacher? Why wouldn't he shut down the people when they started calling him their Messiah? Judas had been all in at the beginning. It was one of Jesus' first followers. You see, Jesus spoke with authority on all the topics that Judas cared about the most. God's care for the poor, reviving the spirit of Torah, challenging the corrupt leaders. Judas was transfixed. Finally, he found what he was looking for. But lately, Jesus had been getting out of control. People were putting him on the same level as God, and Jesus wasn't stopping them. And last week, they all had dinner with Zacchaeus. Judas got the whole mercy thing, but Zacchaeus had personally defrauded Judas' friends and family. What about accountability? How could Jesus turn his back on his own people? Worse than that, though, was Jesus' relationship with those women. People were going hungry, but Jesus was letting these women cover him in expensive perfume. They were using their hair to wipe his feet. It was indecent. Sure, they were nice girls, but this wasn't exactly helping the movement's public appearance. If Jesus kept this up, no one was going to take him seriously anymore. Judas looks at the delegation of Pharisees in the crowd. His face scrunched up like they're sucking on sour lemons. Then he looks at Jesus, oblivious as always, that same blissfully ignorant smile on his face. Tonight. Tonight, Judas will confront him. Tonight, Judas will talk some sense into him. And if that doesn't work, Judas makes one last look at a passing face in the crowd, the representative of one of the chief priests, the one he spoke with while the others were getting the donkey. The man gives Judas a knowing nod. Tonight, if Jesus can't talk some sense into Jesus tonight, he knows what he'll have to do. Mary is in the crowd, too. When she sees her boy riding through the streets, she hears her own song echoing in her ears. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. She sang that song when she was pregnant with Jesus, when she was visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant too, with another gift from God named John. Oh, John, he and Jesus grew up together. They did everything together. Mary remembers how she cradled Elizabeth in her arms the night that they heard that John had been beheaded. She prays that her own son won't be the next victim of Herod's anger. 
but Jesus is about to pass by, so she pushes back her tears and manages a smile and a wave. She tries to communicate with just her eyes. Oh, my boy, I'm so proud of you. I love you. Be safe. As Jesus rides by, Mary sees things that only a mother would notice. Like how one of Jesus' sandals is starting to come loose where his feet are bouncing along with the donkey. His shoes were always coming loose when he was a little boy, running up and down the hills by their house in Galilee. She feels the urge to push the others away and stop the procession just long enough to tighten it up again. She can't keep her boy safe anymore. She knows that. But maybe just that little kindness could be enough. She remembers what Simeon, the prophet of God, she met at the temple when she and Joseph dedicated Jesus, told her, a sword will pierce your own soul, too. And finally, Jesus speaks. I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is it. The point of no return. The stage is set. The actors have taken their places. From this moment on, we hurtle towards the cross, caught up in the unchangeable tides of human failure and divine faithfulness. This is the moment. Let us pray. Jesus, as we come now to the end of this journey to Jerusalem, keep us ever close by your side. This week, let us watch with wonder as you go to the cross once more. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go now into this most holy week, I want to invite you to participate in all of the ways that we get to mark this special time. On Thursday, we will have a Maundy Thursday service that will take place here in the sanctuary, but will also be available on Facebook Live at 7 o'clock. On Friday, we'll have a time of personal guided prayer that you can come to anytime between eight o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon. Just a chance to have a moment alone with God to reflect on Good Friday. And of course, on Easter, we will have three in-person services at our typical times, 8.15, 9.45, and 11.15 as well as a pre-recorded service that will go live at six o'clock in the morning. I invite you to participate in all of these ways that we can mark this holy week. Now, as you go from this place, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own, Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.